Good day, everyone. Thank you for coming to a webinar. We're very excited about this. This is one of our biggest webinars yet. Um, so today we're going to go into a deep dive into lager beer, uh, tr the traditional style and from its modern yeast perspective. So with us today, we have two speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Dr. Matthias Hutzler uh, from Re Regensburg, Germany. A little background on him. Um, so from 1999 to 2004, he studied food science or food technology and biotechnology at the Technical University of Munich. And then from 2004 to 2009, he served as a scientific assistant at, uh, for the chair of brewing technology uh, at the Technical University of Munich, Weinstefan. Uh, and the topic for his doctoral thesis was the differentiation of industrial and spoilage yeast based on novel rapid methods. And then since 2009, he served as the division manager of the accredited laboratory and beverage, uh, and sorry, the accredited laboratory for brewing and beverage microbiology in the research center of Weinstefan for beer and food quality. And then from 2013 to 2019, uh, he served as the associate lecturer for microbiology, biodiversity of the brewing process, and for beer substances and human physiology. Really interesting courses. Um, and then this was at the Department for Brewing Science in the Technical University of Berlin. Um, now he's an active member of the Central European Commission for Brewing Analysis and coordinator of the Working Committee on Microbiology. So his current research focuses on brewing microbiology, yeast technology, and alternative fermentations. Then our next speaker will be a colleague of mine, Eric Abbott, who studied at the University of British Columbia, where he completed his bachelor's degree in biochemistry and then attained a master's in botany. Um, after that, he worked professionally as a brewer for seven years prior to joining Lollamond in 2017, where he began work as the R&D uh, QC lab tech or uh, associate scientist, uh, where he then moved into the technical sales role that he holds today. Uh, so in his current role as the technical support manager for Lollamond Brewing, he works very closely uh, with myself in R&D, as well as sales, marketing, and our new product development team to bring our consumers the best possible products that we can offer. Um, so as this presentation or as this webinar goes on, feel free to start asking questions in the ask a question box. So that will be located just at the bottom right hand of your screen next to the say something um, chat box there. And then what we'll do is, uh, you know, as long as like, there are questions coming in, we'll, we'll try to answer as many as we can after the presentation. So I will hand off the floor to Dr. Matthias Hutzler and uh, we'll, under, we'll go from there. So I share my screen, switch the video off. So thank you, Avi, for the nice and kind introduction. Um, my focus today is a little bit uh, the story of the lager yeast with some historic um, focus and um, my colleague Eric he then will focus on the novel product so I think I'll do the historic part and let's say the traditional part and Eric will go to the novelties um, so let's get started where does the word uh, yeast come from so in different languages uh, the yeast the word for yeast is always related to the behavior of the yeast in brewing. You see here a nice Krausen layer of an open fermentation vessel. So a lot of foam here. And in this foam, you find the yeast. So in some languages, like in German, yeast comes from the word uh, heben, which means to lift or rise to, rise, rise to the top. It means the yeast goes up. In other languages, like uh, in uh, French, uh, levure comes from levé, or levantar in Spanish from, uh, is also lift or rise, and the yeast word is levadura. 
And in languages like English, yeast is like the foam that is produced during fermentation, similar to the Dutch word gist or cestos in Greek. So that means our ancestors, they knew exactly that this foam was active and that there was something going on and that you can use it for repitching. So uh, this is the interesting thing that this uh, behavior also was manifested in, um, in the language. And later we also go to the bottom fermenting yeast, to the lager yeast. So when you take the bottom sediment, this also works well, but we will see later. So what is the, the, the main purpose of the yeast? We uh, at the Institute often say the yeast is like a black box. First, uh, after your hot process in brewing, you have your wort made from uh, barley malt or also yeast malt and hops. And this sweet substrate is then transformed to beer. I always tell the students, think about this to, um, let's say, liquids. It's so different. And what is between is the yeast. And when you choose a lager yeast, like here in the uh, main picture in the middle, then you get a very neutral and very good drinkable beer. And if you choose a wheat beer yeast, like here, it is more aromatic. Or if you choose a Saccharomycotis Ludwigi or Toro Las Bora del Brücki, you get lighter beers with less alcohol. So this impact of the yeast is incredible. And more than 70% of the beer aroma compounds come from this yeast metabolism. So we have many yeast species and yeast strains in brewing. Uh, the main species are Saccharomyces pastorianus. That's all about today. So this is the lager yeast. It's a hybrid between two species. The other uh, yeast species like Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which ferments at higher temperatures and which uh, has, um, let's say, a little bit more uh, aroma production in general and which has more genetic diversity uh, is used for wheat beer, for Belgian beers, Kölsch alt styles, also some indigenous beers. Uh, and those non-Saccharomyces strains, it's like a very novel movement that these strains are used uh, very much now in also in science it's like an explosion that there's a lot of science going on with the non saccharomyces yeast and it's like a new universe but now let's go back to the lager yeast this is our main topic today what is so special about the lager yeast it's a hybrid between Eubayanus, a wild ancestors ancestor it was first found in Patagonia, later in Tibet, and also in the States and in New Zealand. Uh, and a top fermenting Saccharomyces cerevisiae from the wheat beer clade. And what makes this hybrid of these both parental lineages so special? First, it's the cryotolerance. It can ferment at low temperatures. It has a very good sedimentation and flocculation property. Uh, what comes from the Cerevisia part? It's the maltose fermentation, the strong maltose fermentation, fast maltose fermentation, and the maltose triose fermentation. And uh, after this domestica domestication process and the evolution it, uh, also is POF negative, so we do not have phenolic substances in the beer like for vinyl guyacol for vg and it has a strong ph drop <clears throat> so and the special thing about lager yeast that there is in general it's not so spe special because it's neutral it has no strong aroma it is very balanced crisp is refreshing has a very good mouth feel and the main thing is it has a very good drinkability and this is only possible with this hybrid, this long lager time where also bitter substances are uh, <coughs> um, uh, um, fall out during this uh, lager process 
and also this uh, neutral uh, aroma behavior. So I'm also doing yeast hunting with my colleagues here. And uh, the question is, where does this Ubayanus really come from? Uh, it's like a driving force. During this research, we also found a lot of other yeast species that are appropriate for brewing. But in Europe, we haven't found this uh, Ubayanus yet. Uh, maybe our nature is not uh, as primal as it should be anymore. It, maybe it's lost. Maybe we will find it in some, let's say, untouched corners. But nobody knows. Up to now, we have not uh, found it yet. And the closest relative is the strains or the strains from Tibet. So there is this Silk Road theory that maybe it came here from Asia via the Silk Road. But uh, let's see. I also will tell a little bit more about the lager yeast um, <clears throat> development or evo evolution in Europe. If you go now uh, to history, uh, brewing is very old. These are some pictures from Göbekli Tepe, 10,000 before Christ. So hunters and gatherers, they already produced uh, here vessels, containers from uh, limestone, and uh, probably they were used for brewing. Imagine how much effort it is to produce such a fermentation vessel with simple tools. So brewing and alcohol consumption must have been very important. And over time, people um, made like a trial and error evolution of these fermented beverages and also beer, take the sediment, take the foam and improve those beverages, try other temperature, try other substrate. With the microscope, there was another evolution. So you could observe if there are some structures in those beverages. They didn't know that it's microbes, but you could see those different structures and then make some correlations. If you have that yeast-like yeast -like structures, maybe it tasted more clean or more alcoholic. Uh, less sour, and that's how it done. And then 1883, please keep that in mind. This was the big step. Emil Christian Hansen developed the pure culture technique, and from that we could do controlled fermentation. And then also take single strains, um, isolate very potential strains, very high performance strains. And now we are in an age where we also could use these single strains in controlled mixtures. So all this uh, modern fermentation technology was after 1883. Now a small story. Emil Christian Hansen, he had some competitors, some German guys from Berlin, Paul Lindner and Max Delbrück. They also developed a technique to isolate, isolate single strains in small droplet, droplets under the microscope. And... Um, Emil Christian Hansen developed this single uh, uh, colony technique and he had very close relation to Gabriel Siedelmeier from the Munich Stadt Sparten Brewery. He brought the lager yeast to Denmark and they isolated the lager yeast, the Munich lager yeast, and made the first pure cultures. There was a scientific uh, discussion. Emil Christian Hansen said, this is the best beer, the beer made from one single culture, from one single cell, and it makes a very pure beer. The Berlin guy said, no, uh, the beer is too neutral. It doesn't taste uh, good anymore. It's uh, like water. And uh, they said it's better to keep the normal uh, and original culture, propagate one yeast cell, and inoculate this in a higher concentration, but leave the background as it is. And then you have your house taste plus a better fermentation. But in the end, Emil Christian Hansen, they won. And everybody uh, is doing now pure culture beer. But the idea is very interesting because maybe that can also be an option for the future again. When you think about farmhouse ales, quake breweries, that's in principle, the idea of uh, the Berlin guys. 
So this is just a picture to show you how this works. They made some scratches on microscopic slides, put some small droplets in. If there was one single cell, they could observe, they could soak it up with a sterile paper and go into another um, sterile world um, and propagate the yeast. This shows here with the Lindner method, you also could do microbiology and check if there is contamination strains or wild yeast or bacteria there. And it just shows these are now lager barrels that everything was a mixture. So before 1883 and also uh, a long period uh, after, um, the, there were still, um, let's say, mixed fermentation going on everywhere. This is a picture of wood. When you imagine there was a lot of wood, this is when wood grows fast. You have uh, big vacuoles, big, let's say, air holes. And here, if it grows uh, uh, slow, you have smaller holes, but this is perfect for mi microbes. So if you think about the brewing process and all the wood that was used, uh, this was perfect for microbe attachment. So these slides, in very brief, you could talk about hours with these slides, but it just shows from the left bottom corner to the right top corner, the evolution to the modern lager beer, the most successful beer in the world. First, they didn't cook, but then cooking came, then the hops came in, and then those cellars and the cold fermentation and the long lager process came. So it's a very long process until this modern lager beer was developed. And why it was developed? We had this bottom fermentation arising uh, approximately at 1300. This is a Franconian rock cellar. So there they fermented the beer and lagered the beer. It, there was a natural cold environment. And when you see here, this is climatic data. Those red um, uh, tops of this uh, graphs this were, were like small ice ages. So there was a colder climate and also wine production wasn't working so well anymore in these conditions. Beer was uh, the favorite drink. And uh, they recognized when they do this fermentation in the cellar that uh, the beer was uh, very pure. Um, so <clears throat> And in the 15th, 16th century, uh, there are written documents that this cold beer makes a very nice uh, flavor, a very clean flavor, and uh, how to do it. So this is also documented. And this is now a lager beer production in the 19th century, also already with active uh, cooling later then. So just some impressions of such old Franconian beer cellars, how you can still find them. We also did yeast hunting there. So and when we uh, did this uh, research, we read a lot of document and uh, my colleague Franz Moisdorfer did a very deep historic research. He recognized that the uh, wheat beer production in Bohemia, in Czech, nowadays Czech Republic, was very special. And probably that there maybe could be cold brewing and uh, warmer brewing. So they were, there was all um, mixed fermentation, but that the hybridization could maybe took, uh, have uh, take, uh, took place here in Bohemia. But this is just a hypothesis. Later, Bavaria uh, was strictly bottom fermenting. Only a few exceptions uh, could make wheat beer at higher temperature. And in this time, 1602 to 1615, um, the Hofbräuhaus in München was the only brewery which had uh, also the wheat beer right, uh, the only big brewery. And here, bottom and top fermenting brewing process was going on side by side uh, for more than 10 years in very big volumes. And there were two 
proved events that two brewmasters came from other sites, one from Einbeck. This beer was very famous at the time because it was stronger. And from Schwarzach, this was a very famous wheat beer production site. And both brewmasters took their top fermenting strains with them. And we think that in the bottom fermenting process, this would it was probably a mixture between Ubayanus and Uvarum, uh, um, so cold tolerant yeast, and there must have been this hybridization in the Hofbräuhaus probably. So later on, this yeast also spread to all the other Munich breweries. There were at that time about 80 breweries in Munich, and all they, uh, they all exchanged their yeast, so this was like a um, um, a very uh, good yeast exchange at that time. I made a map here which should show the evolution of the lager yeast. So this was the original region in uh, southern Germany. So this is Germany and this is southern Germany, Bavaria, the region of Franconia and Upper Palatine. And here the, there was this rock uh, cellar cold fermentation that also spread then over Bavaria and in Munich, uh, probably there was then this first hybridization uh, between those cold tolerant yeast and the Cerevisie that came from Schwarzach and Einbeck. And then later, Sedelmeier took the yeast to Copenhagen to the Kreuzberg lab, and here the, uh, the lager yeast were isolated. The astonishing thing is we made a publication uh, with uh, Brigitte Gallone, Kevin Verstrepen, the Belgian colleagues, Jan Stenzels, and they did a genetic, phylogenetic uh, time calculation. And here you have the, the modern lager yeast, Sartz and Froberg. And if you check their Cerevisiae parental part, uh, you can see that uh, this um, let's say that this branch uh, is uh, spread or divided almost about uh, 1600, exactly the time where these events happened in the Hofbräuhaus um, or where this doc the, uh, these actions were documented, these <clears throat> events. So here the the genetic data fits to the historic data, and it must have been in Munich, one uh, hybridization. Now we go to another lager yeast strain, a modern high performance lager yeast strain. This is the TUM 3470. It's very well known. It's probably one of the most used lager strains worldwide. And uh, it was the main topic of Professor Nazis, a very famous beer researcher from Germany, who published in his dissertation that this yeast was uh, the best performing strain. Also in terms of the aroma profile, it was very acceptable. And this was in 1956. In um, 1970, the beer was re-isolated again uh, at the Wein Stefan State Brewery. That's why it has now this name 3470. And originally it came from Augsburg. And after the consulting here of our TU Munich colleagues and Professor Nazis, this yeast strain become uh, one of the most successful yeast strains in the world. And the characterization of this yeast strain is like a blueprint for other lager yeast uh, characterization. So in 2002, Dr. Wagner, another old colleague who also un who unfortunately died uh, this year, um, he made a characterization of a lot of um, lager, flocculent lager strains, Froberg lager strains, so with high fermentation performance. And this is a tasting scheme according to DLG points. Five is maximum 
one is uh, um, minimum or zero is minimum. Uh, no, um, one, excuse me, one is minimum. And let's say uh, like over 4.0, it's a very acceptable beer and the higher the grade, the better. So 4.4 4 is a very good grade for the tasting results. Then they also check the fermentation. This is the, the uh, apparent degree of fermentation in the standardized word. So this was the second or one of the best performing yeast in terms of fermentation performance. The 3470 strain also has a very good pH drop, always below 4.5. So that's very important in terms of microbiology. And this is very important that cells in suspension uh, <clears throat> after the main fermentation. It should not be too low because you also need some yeasts for the uh, maturation and lager pro uh, uh, process. And it should not be too high to get not too much yeast autolysis. So this is like in a perfect range, this 15 million cells per milliliter. And also very important is the diacetyl reduction. So in the green beer, the diacetyl was a little bit below uh, 0 0.8. And after maturation, uh, it was below the threshold 0 0.1. So you could not uh, taste or recognize the diacetyl. So this is also very important data. The esters are pronounced, so you have a very uh, flavorful beer and the fusel alcohols are very low. So this is a very good result and compromise. As I told you, this yeast is like a reference strain. We also made a lot of studies later so here you don't find 3470 here because the data was used as reference data. And if you compare other important uh, bottom fermenting lager strains, you see 5% lower or 5% higher or two arrows is 10% lower. So lager yeast, they are very close, but let's say this, those subtle differences, they are often very important if you want to differentiate your beer. And you can observe all those different attributes. So for uh, our <clears throat> um, customers and colleagues, we also made some leaflets. And here a brewer can check how the yeast is performing only in one slide and also check the aroma profile. And here you can see another very successful strain, the Securitas strain here from TU Munich that makes a little bit more SO2 for better flavor stability. So uh, here you can see that um, there are subtle differences, but that can pronounce your beer or you can create the beer you want. Now I'm ready or the last slide is uh, some outlook. So we established some old historic strains. We still have like 70 strains that are not used very often and every strain is a little bit different. Uh, in America, our strain Franconia TUM3475 is very successful. It's even more neutral than the 3470. Then low flocculent strains that produce a lot of sulfur in some special beers, they can be interesting or for re-fermentation. Some use uh, salt strains, they are maltotriose negative and make a very good mouse feel because maltotriose is still there. It's only a little bit sweet, but uh, makes a very good uh, mouthfeel and body. Mixed fermentations are um, often tried now in research and also in breweries. Then this is the topic of Eric. New Ubayanos Cerevisi hybrids are very good options. Um, then also lager strains and high temperature and um, <clears throat> also at very low temperatures can produce very different beers, so go to the limit. And we'd also try other cryotolerant species like Uvarum or Uvarum, Ubayanos hybrid, also very interesting beer, and then etc. cetera, et cetera. And then my last picture. So this uh, August, we were two months in, uh, uh, two weeks in uh, Georgia doing yeast hunting there. The aim is maybe to find Ubayanos on the way, uh, on 
the Silk Road also goes to Georgia, Caucasus, and we found very old brewing sites. We found hops at almost 2,000 meters here, the yeast in this old brewing sites and trees that are incredible because they are very old. And we hope that we can increase biodiversity and also find maybe wild cryotolerant yeast to um, make those accessible for brewing. Thank you very much. And now, Eric, it's your turn. AV, thank you very much. I close the video. And mute. Okay. Thank you, Matthias, for that presentation. It's excellent to hear about the, the history of lager yeast for this uh, traditional style. Um, I'm going to be focusing in my presentation more on the modern yeast perspectives and um, what new lager technologies are coming onto the market today. So I'll share my screen now. So there's several yeasts, several beer styles that are defined by their yeast. And Cezanne beer is defined by this very high attenuating diastatic yeast, uh, producing very dry beers with nice fruity esters, spicy phenols. Wheat beers, of course, are defined by their characteristic banana and clove flavor and low flocculation. Uh, Kvike yeast, uh, we're, um, modern brewers are discovering what Norwegian farmhouse brewers have known for quite a long time. Uh, the capabilities of these very high fermentation tolerant, uh, high temperature tolerant yeast for very fast fermentations with a range of different flavor profiles. Lager yeast, of course, is defined by the Saccharomyces pastorianus hybrid. Uh, it's a cold tolerant yeast producing generally very clean, crisp and refreshing beers. Um, as Matthias mentioned, it was... Uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus came about as a result of a natural hybridization event between Cerevisiae and Saccharomyces ubionis, and with the selection and domestication of this strain in European lager breweries. Now, I'm pulling up the same, uh, this same graph from the Gallon et al. Nature, Ecology, and Evolution paper. Um, showing the, the lager, um, lager group two and lager group one, Sa lager group one Saas and lager group two Frogberg uh, strains. Um, what's interesting to notice here is that there's very low genetic diversity. If we look at the heat map from the top right here, the blue and purple indicates a very low um, rate of uh, mutation over, over time. Uh, so there's very low genetic diversity between all of the current group one and group two Froberg strain, uh, group group one and group two lager strains, um, <clears throat> which suggests that there's there could be a lot of potential for the introduction of new pastor, pastorianus strains with uh, that are genetically distinct and with a unique uh, fermentation flavor profiles. So the search for new lager yeast. So the Ubionis strain was only discovered in the wild uh, for the first time in 2011 on galls that are growing on southern beech trees in Patagonia. Um, the Ubionis strain is cold tolerant, but wild versions are typically POF positive and maltotrio is negative. So not ideal for the use in hybridization, hybridization for uh, brewing purposes. Uh, in the lab, uh, researchers have been able to produce um, hybrids using uh, rare mating events, um, to, using wild um, eubionis strains, but they're not ideal for brewing because of the fermentation characteristics and flavor. Um, the characteristics we would like to see in a new Saccharomyces pastorianus lager strain is cold tolerance, POF negative, as well as maltotriose positive to produce a nice uh, clean fermenting dry um, lager yeast. 
Um, some other characteristics that could be desirable are low off flavors, for example, H2S and diacetyl, fast fermentation times, shorter maturation times, as well as an interesting and unique flavor profile. Let's look at the genomic structure of the traditional lager strains. So we see the group one strain, the SAS strains on top, they have two copies of the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, sorry, uh, two copies of the eubionis genome and a single copy of the cerevisiae genome. They are a little bit more cold tolerant, not as commonly used uh, commercially though. Group two Froberg strains are tetraploid. They contain four sets of chromosomes, two from eubionis and two from cerevisiae. They're a little bit more robust, a little bit faster fermenting. Uh, and, we, and if we look at the uh, the characteristics of the eubionis genome in particular, we see that through the domestication of these strains in European lager breweries, they've selected for optimal flavor and fermentation characteristics. The eubionis domesticated genome is maltotriose positive and POF negative, which uh, contributes to the very clean, dry, and neutral flavor characteristics of commercial lager strains on the market today. The eubionis genome, as we mentioned, is maltotriose negative and POF positive. So if we're going to use, if we're going to try to make a new Saccharomyces pastearianus hybrid between, um, by mating a cerevisiae and a eubionis, it's not ideal to use the wild eubionis. What we might be able to do is to extract the subgenome the eubionis subgenome of the um, of the domesticated lager strains, and this could be done uh, using the Group Two Froberg uh, lager strains as a base because they are able to form spores and to mate uh, sexually, as opposed to asexually. Um, so the goal is to combine a cerevisiae parental strain with the the extracted domesticated eubionis subgenome from um, one of the traditional domesticated lager strains to produce new novel pastorianus hybrids with new characteristics. And this is exactly what was done uh, by uh, Zachary Turjan and uh, the group from Renaissance Bioscience in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, this work was published in Applied and Environmental Microbiology in a paper in February last year. Um, it's a great paper, it's worth a read for um, more detail about the, the methods they use to produce these novel um, Pastarianus yeast hybrids. Um, and these methods are non-GMO um, and um, similar to the type of breeding that you would be doing with uh, commercial crops, for example. Um, I'm going to outline a little bit um, in more detail how this new lager lineage was produced. Um, as a base, uh, Group 2 Froberg domestic Pastoriana strain was used um, using sporulation. Uh, they were in, um, induced to sporulate and um, they were screened to, to obtain a diploid version of the group two Froberg strain, which contains only one copy of each of the Cerevisiae and Eubionis genomes. Um, using this, they were able to use adaptive evolution strategies to disrupt the SRS pathway, which is involved in sulfur metabolism, notably the production of H2S. Um, so by dis disrupting this pathway, they were able to inhibit the production of H2S in, in these strains. Taking this strain as, a, as one of the parental strains and combining it with um, a Cervisier strain, which was a, a neutral ale strain that had been uh, selected to have a non-functional MET10 gene, meaning that it is, it is not capable of producing H2S. Combining this Pastoriana strain with the Cervisi strain, we were able to produce a completely novel 
uh, Saccharomyces pastorianus hybrid. Um, tetraploid uh, containing four sets of um, chromosomes, three from the Cervisier parent and one from um, a Eubionis parental strain. This defined the group three, a novel logger lineage. We, we've been calling the Renaissance lineages. So now we have group one, Saz, group two, Froberg, and now group three, the novel Renaissance lineage is a true Saccharomyces pastorianus strain containing uh, chromosomes from both Cervisier and Eubionis. Uh, this particular example produces low H2S, is maltotriose positive, cryotolerant, bottom fermenting, and producing clean flavor and aroma. Uh, looking at the genomic structure, compared, comparing the three logger groups, group one SAS contains uh, two thirds Eubionis, one third Cervisier. The group two Froberg strains contain half Eubionis and half Cervisier. The novel group three Renaissance strains com contain 75% Cervisier and 25% Eubionis that is derived originally from the, the Froberg group two uh, lager strains. Um, depending on the strain produced, uh, um, the strain selected, the characteristics may vary depending on the specific um, the specific Cervisier parent that was used in the breeding. In Lalman Brewing, we, re we released last month the first commercial example of a group three lager strain. And this is Lalbrew Nova Lager, uh, the Cervisier parent was a neutral American ale strain with the inhibited uh, MET10 gene producing low quantities of off flavors such as H2S, but also producing low levels of diacetyl SO2 and acetaldehyde. Um, the flavor profile is clean and uh, quite unique. Uh, we've determined that it does have biotransformation capabilities with an active beta-glucosidase gene. Uh, it's a very robust strain with high viability, producing fast fermentations and allowing for shorter maturation times and lower pitch rates using this strain compared to other commercial strains on the market. Just to show you a little bit what this strain can do, Nova Lager um, fermenting at 12 degrees in a standard wort is able to reach full attenuation uh, in a faster time compared to Diamond and Nottingham strains, the other uh, strains commonly used from Lalman Brewing to produce lagers. Um, it also has a reduced diacetyl production. Now, diacetyl production is related to valine metabolism. Um, traditional lager strains typically have lower valine uptake from the, the wort. So they prefer to produce their own valine. Valine biosynthesis is upregulated in typical lager strains. And this means that the pathway from pyruvate through acetolactate and to produce valine will be more active. There will be more acetolactate that will be produced as an intermediate and released into the fermenting beer to uh, spontaneously uh, transform into diacetyl, which would be then reabsorbed into the cell. So lager strains typically will produce more more diacetyl as a result of valine, um, of reduced valine uptake. Ale strains are the opposite. They will uptake more valine from the wort and they will produce less on their own and therefore produce lower amounts of acetolactate and diacetyl. <clears throat> and we see this in the, in the graph here. Uh, Nova Lager has a reduced, uh, sorry, it has a, an increased valine uptake, so lower levels of valine in the wort compared to other strains such, other lagers, traditional lager strains such as Diamond. And indeed, we do see that this has an influence on diacetyl levels. Uh, Nova Lager has lower diacetyl production compared to traditional lager strains such as Diamond and also compared to um, 
a, a strain like Nottingham, which is an ale strain that can be, um, it, is, it is also cryo tolerant and able to be used for producing lager style beers, even though it's not a traditional or true um, lager strain. Um, and we, we expect that this is related to the amount of uh, DNA derived from Saccharomyces cerevisiae in Nova Lager. So it's three quarters cerevisiae and one quarter ubianus. So greater valine uptake and lower diacetyl production as a result. Nova Lager has extremely low undetectable levels of H2S production. So comparing this to a typical lager strain, as well as a diamond. Um, in yellow, we see a, a popular lager strain that is commonly used. Um, and diamond produces similar levels of H2S uh, compared to uh, other traditional lager strains. Nottingham, an ale strain that is cryotolerant, produces much lower levels. This is a, you see in the, in the box here that, um, when we zoom in, Nottingham produces very low levels. Um, Nova Lager produces undetectable levels of H2S. Now, of note, um, we're showing total H2S production uh, throughout fermentation. This is not representative of the quantities in the finished beer. I mentioned this because uh, the quantities you see on this scale are well above threshold detection uh, for H2S, um, but the, the levels typically found in the finished beer will be much lower. However, the if you produce less H2S uh, in the first place, there's less to get rid of. There's less for the yeast to reabsorb at the end of fermentation. And the, you will typically have uh, lower amounts in the, the final product as well. Brewing properties of Nova Lager, uh, we've in our Standard conditions wart in our lab, 12 degrees Plato, 12 degrees Celsius, and pitching at 50 grams per hectoliter. We see fast fermentations completed in six days, reaching between 78 and 84% attenuation. Um, a clean flavor profile with slight esters, uh, notably red apple and other fruits. Um, a wide fermentation range from 10 to 20 degrees Celsius, and some of our trials have even demonstrated that um, it performs well outside of our, this recommended range as well, uh, above 20 degrees. Um, low H2S production and low diacetyl production. Uh, flavor profiles clean, low to medium esters with no sulfur. And there is biotransformation potential from an active beta glucosidase gene, uh, which is ideal for producing modern hoppy, hoppy lager styles such as um, India Pale Lager or uh, Cold IPA. Um, to show a comparison here of the three strains that we have for producing lager styles. Diamond, that would be used for producing very traditional lager styles. Nottingham, it's a practical and convenient option for people who may be using this strain for other types of beers in the brewery. It is cold tolerant and able to produce very nice, clean pseudo lagers. And Nova Lager, an innovative and modern addition to our lager portfolio, um, producing a very unique uh, lager beers. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, we'll address some of them now, but you could also send questions to me directly at brewing at lalamon.com. I want to mention as well that there is an upcoming web webinar that we will host sometime in November. The date has not been set yet. We will discuss in detail um, some of the, tri the commercial trials that have been done with the Lalbrew Nova Lager strain. Um, you could uh, keep in touch with us by clicking on the, the follow button um, to follow the crowdcast that we, uh, that we run th with uh, Lalamon Brewing. And there's a button at the bottom of the screen as well to sign up for new product information uh, related to Nova Lager and uh, to have access to our mailing list as well. So with that, I'll, I'll invite everybody to um, come back on screen. Um, Matthias and Abby, and we can address some of the, the questions that have uh, 
come up during the presentation. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So very good presentations. Um, looks like we have some some good questions coming up through the through the question feature. Um, let's see. Looks like one of the more popular questions or question with the most upvotes. Can we talk about logger time, fermentation times? Oh, uh, modern breweries now do three weeks rather than six weeks. Um, would either of you like to address that question? Yeah. Shall I maybe yeah. answer yeah. first? Yeah. yeah, why don't you take that? Yeah, one? Um, yeah. So uh, that depends very much, uh, let's say, on your strategy of lager brewing. So if you make like a very traditional, very low fermentation in the low lager process, the advantages is uh, that the aroma profile, if you use like uh, the standard lager strain, um, <clears throat> is very neutral and uh, you have lower easters. Also, if your pitching rate is uh, adjusted well, and then the long lager time that de depends on the aim of your uh, mouse feel and the crispiness of your beer. So what happens during lagering? You have a sediment long sedimentation process. You take out uh, proteins and prote protein polyphenol complexes. And if you reduce them, the beer becomes what it is. There's also still a lot uh, unknown in this process, but this is empirical. The longer you lager, maybe the better the crispiness and the neutrality and the drinkability of your beer is. For sure, you can adjust this process and make trials, but uh, that depends on your tanks. Do you have vertical tanks? Do you have uh, horizontal tanks? Uh, which uh, yeast concentration do you have? And uh, that's very complex, but the question is very good. You have to find the right time for your lager beer. Also, depending on the aim, how it should taste, especially the mouse feel. And uh, about the no Novo Lager, I can tell you anything. <laughs> Maybe you already have some uh, some ideas or some experiments done on that. I don't know. Uh, just to add to that. Um... Some of the traditional lager methods were developed using historical malts that were of much lower quality. So step mashing, decoction mashing, uh, you get much more benefit with uh, lower quality malts compared to higher quality malts. And same for lagering times. Uh, these um, these traditions were uh, were started before we were able to detect off flavors using various methods. If you're able to do a, a test for um, VDKs to determine you have no remaining diacetyl or precursors, um, if the reason you are um, doing a maturation is to uh, reduce that uh, diacetyl, for example, um, if it's already gone, there's no point of um, um, keeping it for longer. Um, and there's going to be variation based on your equipment, as uh, Matthias mentioned. Um, go ahead and reduce those maturation times unless you see a benefit from it. Uh, there's no problems in, uh, in principle for re reducing those maturation times um, from six weeks down to three, for example. I completely agree with Eric. Now we <laughs> live in another time or another century. Energy is much more important. Cooling costs a lot of money and uh, this should be adjusted, but uh, you should also match your, your, let's say, your beer profile you wish. So, so, but it's a good way to, to hear, try and do trials. You also can go the perfect beer with, with two weeks, yeah, if you adjust your process uh, the right way. All right, thank you. Another popular question is, this might be good for you, Eric. Um, how is the flavor profile compared to W3470? Um, yeah. I, I, uh, um, so more about focusing on the ester fruity characteristics. Yeah. I, I, notably, it is a slightly more, more ester. 
um, very clean absence of off flavors um, such as H2S, uh, acetaldehyde, um, and diacetyl in particular. Um, it's very, very clean in terms of uh, off flavors, but there will be more ester contribution. Um, and um, there will also, depending on what style of beer you're using it for, uh, you would also see um, some contribution from uh, the biotransformation as well. Um, we do, we, we've we have measured the biotransformation capabilities in the lab, but we've had this confirmed in, in commercial trials as well. People are noticing that um, the Nova Lager version is a little bit hoppier. Um, so it, it, it accentuates well the, the, the hop aromas in a, in a slightly hoppier lager style. Um, I hope that answers the question. We're, we're, we're still getting data in about the um, commercial trials in terms of uh, specific ester flavors when people are brewing such a huge range of different styles and recipes um, during our commercial trials. But as, as a general rule, it, it will be slightly more ester than the 3470 strain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a couple questions. This will be a double question, actually, because this is this will be particularly interesting for yeast physiology in general and for historical purposes as well. So we have two questions. Um, Matthias, you, you might be able to answer this. So if yeast produce asexually, how are there how are there hybrids of two different yeasts? And um, can you repeat? the name of or the historical origin for 3470 okay. like the specific name thank you for that question uh, so sure during brewing um, uh, in most cases uh, the yeast produce asexually and form clones but if they're in stress conditions and if they are still let's say wild enough uh, they can uh, produce fertile ascospores under these stress conditions and we think in those brewing cellars in Munich in the uh, around 1600 that there must be those two species they formed ascospores. And if you are lucky, two species they can form ascospores beyond the species border. Just think about Neanderthalians and uh, Homo sapiens. There were also uh, hybrids or Denosova. Uh, um, <clears throat> humans and um, dinosaurians and homo sapiens and the same is uh, they are quite close those species eubianos uh, and uh, they have the same genus and this must be this let's say rare mating under stress condition i imagine a bucket anywhere in the forgotten in the corner with uh, crop yeast and they formed ascospores and then there was this mating there maybe put into a new brew something like that but we will never know because we have no time machine. And then we, when we go back to um, the question about uh, the name 3470, this is very interesting. After the Second World War, here in TU Munich, Wein Stefan, they started with the numbers one, two, three, four, very simple. And it was just the 34th yeast that was isolated. So the 34th clone. And then they put it to cryo. Or in this time, it was not cryo, cryo it was um, freeze-dried storage culture. And then, um, yeah, they used this strain in the brewing. And 1970, it was used, re-isolated from a brewery. So that was like a strategy to take a pure strain, let it run in a brewery, like 10, 20 generations, and then take it back and then it adapted to the world. So this is, was like an old empirical strategy. Thank you so much for those interesting question yeah it's it's always fascinating to learn like where our common nomenclature comes from like mm -hmm. uh how strains get their names it kind of lends mm -hmm. a very uh it, it lends a very interesting historical aspect to it like the tradition behind it and, and everything yeah. so that's pretty cool um so eric this one is more geared towards you um this it seems pretty popular people are wondering if there are any differences between fermenting at 10 degrees versus 20 degrees. So I'm assuming that this is specifically targeted towards Nova Lager. 
Yeah, I I would say that um, you, you you in terms of flavor profile, um, there is a complete absence of off flavors at 10 degrees and at 20 degrees. So that doesn't change uh, with many lager strains. If you increase the temperatures outside the recommended range, they will tend to produce um, things like um, H2S. Um, that's completely absent for the Nova Lager strain. Um, in terms of fermentation speed, um, you get certainly more advantage from fermenting a little bit warmer. Um, and you will be able to use lower pitch rates when fermenting warmer. That there's less of a difference at the lower temperatures. What we've seen with our commercial trials, um, some brewers have been, I think, hesitant to push the, the limits on the first try. Um, but the, the people who have gone to the warmer temperature ranges have been generally very happy with it. And a nice, clean tasting beer um, with a, a unique flavor profile. Very good. Thank you. Uh, I also can um, mention one remark. So um, when you have an increase of uh, 10 Kelvin or 10 degrees, uh, then um, normally you have like a doubling of fermentation speed. It's not one by one, but it's like a, a rough rule uh, or, or like a, a approximate rule. And uh, the other thing is that the Easter production uh, normally is higher for most strains, but you cannot generalize. But if you want to have fruitier beers, that's when you think about California common beer style, it's fruitier. But you, then you also should check uh, your higher alcohols because some strains also produce more higher alcohols, fusel alcohols at higher temperatures. So that would be a recommendation. If you do something like this, I also would go for the fermentation byproduct profiling. Yeah. Now, not for the speaking of the Novo Lager, but general for all these. No, it's, it's, it's a really good, good point too, yeah. yeah. Uh, because, you know, we have to understand that that despite being a, a modern novel hybrid, it still does contain a lot of those characteristics that the traditional uh, Pastorianus species um, has, both genetically, phenotypically, and genotypically. So it's, it's, it's a really good point to bring up. Um, next question. Um, again, this is more geared probably towards Eric, uh, specifically about the functionality of, of Nova Lager. Um, so despite its low diacetyl production, does the hybrid lager strain still benefit from a temperature elevation rest near the end of fermentation or ferment or uh, diacetyl rest? Yeah, it's a good question. And it kind of ties in with uh, one of the first questions about uh, maturation time, whether it's necessary. Traditionally, you will need to do a diacetyl rest uh, with the traditional lager strains um, in, in most cases. In our commercial trials, we found that about two thirds of the the trial breweries still did a diacetyl rest. Um, so, of the thirty percent that did not do a diacetyl rest, um, diacetyl was was not detected. Um, um, generally, we had um, zero diacetyl detected for any of our commercial trials. Um, so, that says to me that it's not essential, but you can probably say that about a, a diacetyl rest in many cases anyway. You do it to to make sure that there's definitely not going to be diacetyl. It reduces the risk of diacetyl if you do a diacetyl rest. Um, is it essential? Perhaps not in some cases, but you should probably be measuring the diacetyl and acetylactate in that case just to be sure. So it sounds like that that also answers um, another question specifically about traditional diacetyl rest procedures. Um, okay. So this would probably be more of a trial and error kind of thing on a brewery for depending on their malt bill um, and the quality of the malt that they're using as well, basically. Um, as Eric had mentioned in his presentation is that um, Nova Lager seems to be pretty good at taking up valine from wort compared to a traditional yeah. Pastorianus species. I, I guess I would say as a general recommendation, if you're really trying to increase output from your brewery and you want to keep your tank time to an absolute minimum, you might be able to 
reduce the diacetyl rest or potentially eliminate it, but I would do that by trial and error and by measuring VDK levels. Um, otherwise, I would probably keep a, a short diacetyl rest um, if you're not stressed for tank space. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think we got time for a couple more questions. This one is really interesting too, because I think that this will actually tie into the MET-10 technology that was implemented with the uh, creation of Nova Lager, um, even though it's a different sulfur species here. So what is the relative SO2 production of Nova Lager? Avi, you might be a better to speak to this than me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as far as SO2 production, it seems to be on par with a pretty typical Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, and we're not seeing like huge amounts of SO2, but again, you know, this can vary depending on the original brewing conditions, the quality and, um, kind of composition of the malt bill itself, but overall, like we're not really seeing too much of an increase or decrease, I would say, kind of falls in average. We're, this is still something that, that we do need to fully characterize as well. Like, I'll, I'll be open about that. But overall, um, it seems to be on par with its, uh, with its Cerevisiae cousins. Um, yeah, I have a um, remark yeah. um, yes. in terms of SO2. So in most countries, like SO2 level uh, is restricted to 10 milligrams per liter. In some countries, it doesn't matter if it's uh, produced during natural fermentation. So that depends on your country. In some countries also it depends on the state. But from my experience, if you have like, um, let's say two to eight milligrams per liter, um, the SO2 doesn't affect, affect flavor, but just increases uh, your flavor stability. So like two milligrams or like one month more flavor stability in terms of oxidation. So it should be maybe taken into account if you modify your process, often lower pitching rate increase and lower ox bird oxygenation increase uh, SO2, but you should not maybe go over the 10 milligram or much more, but just a... Yeah general remark and I think for new strains and novel strains you always have to get a feeling for this and you know which screws you have to to use yeah, yeah especially with something with such a diverse uh, background as well mm -hmm. or genetic background mm -hmm. um, but yeah that's that's an excellent point too because we do know that so2 does uh, have beneficial antioxidant capabilities for specifically for shelf life extension mm -hmm. Um, yeah, let's see what else, what else? I guess people are also really curious if whether or not these slides will be available, if, uh, these slide decks will be available for download at some point, um, seems to so be. I could provide generic. my slides in PDF format. So that's for yeah, sure. You, you could email me at brewing at and I'd be happy to send you a PDF version of both presentations. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So my, this uh, link will be live and available um, using, you could visit the, this presentation again in the future using the same length and it will be eventually posted on YouTube as well. Yeah, my email address is uh, m.hutzler, H-U-T-Z-L-E-R at T-U-M dot D-E. So, uh, or also check it at Research Center Wein, Stefan, T-U-M and my name Hutzler or Hutzler in English. So it can pr provide this, uh, the, the slides. I don't know if there's also a download option from Lalmo, but just inform me, maybe if, if you want to put them anywhere. So. Of course, yeah. Mm. yeah. This is something that, that definitely um, Eric will be able to provide as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, we have time for one more question. So I will I will say this uh, for the general inquiry questions about availability. Um, we do highly encourage you to visit our, our website or inquire um, at our brewing mm -hmm. email as well. Um, that way we'll be able to kind of provide you more definitive answers that will will remain relevant long after this webinar is published. Um, <clears throat> So uh, let's see. 
Just quickly, the 11 gram sachets we expect to release later this fall, likely in November. Um, for people asking about that. Yep. Ah, now this is an interesting question that I personally would like to dive into as well. Um, so how does Nova Lager yeast fare in mead and braggot with the high fructose levels in the wort? <laughs> um, so in the lab, this is, uh, this is kind of an interesting question. In the lab, it seems to really be able to take, um, I would say, like normal levels of glucose. So if you want to do like a whole fermentation with just 12 Plato glucose, it seems to be able to do that all right. Definitely recommend giving some supplementation to that. So in, in the form of like some kind of nitrogen supplementation, I would generally recommend like organic base and not necessarily like USDA organic, but like organically derived nitrogen. So something directly from um, a uh, peptone digest or something. So this is something that you can get from just about any yeast production company as well. I know uh, we have um, Yeast Lifeo, which is specifically geared towards those kinds of fermentations. Uh, but it seems to be pretty tolerant of high gravity situations. Uh, whether or not that can make a good mead, well, I highly recommend that you uh, experiment with that. Yeah, I'd love to hear about any trials related to that. All right. So I think that just about wraps up our time here. And uh, again, like I highly encourage you guys or you know, all guests here to reach out to us um, if you have any specific questions regarding the Nova Logger itself. There's still a lot more research being done on it, um, and we're still finding out new things specifically about um, enzyme expression, uh, different temperature tolerances. Uh, but for the most part, um, we have a pretty good understanding of how it should behave within the standard brewing conditions um, for most breweries. Um, but yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. Again. Lager brewing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And yeah.